Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, yeah, good morning, everybody. And um, thanks for the introduction. And thanks for the invitation to come and come and talk to you at the, the geochemistry meeting. Um, yeah, and, and to introduce the, the latest member of the UK meteorite family. So uh, the last couple of months have been a complete whirlwind for me in particular, but I know for lots of other people in our community, um, this is not what we'd, we'd plan to, to spend our year doing, but it's been incredibly exciting. Uh, and really, I'm kind of just the front person for this. There's a, there's a huge team of people uh, in the UK planetary science community that have been involved in, in recovering this meteorite fall uh, and are now working on the initial um, and doing the initial analysis of, of this sample uh, and doing some of the, the, the first uh, data collection and stuff. Um, and so including including Catherine and, and Queenie who are going to be following me. So really, uh, there's a, you know, it's not just me, there are lots of people from, from lots of different research institutions across the UK and internationally uh, working on this. So uh, very quickly, oh, my cats are destroying the flat. Um, very quickly, uh, for those of you not familiar with meteorites, I thought I'd do a quick uh, 101. Um, so meteorites are basically uh, bits of rock and metal that come to us from space and land on the Earth's surface. Uh, worldwide, uh, we have something like 65 to 70,000 individual meteorites in our collections. Um, we have a few hundred that come from Mars, we have a few hundred that come from the Moon, uh, but the vast majority of our meteorites are coming from, <clears throat> coming from much smaller bodies uh, that we call asteroids. Uh, and these asteroids really are the leftover building blocks for the planets um, that we see in our solar system. So what meteorites allow us to do is basically go back in time 4.6 billion years ago, uh, time zero in our solar system, and, and actually look at what materials were there uh, and how those materials were coming together to start making our solar system. And the, uh, the cosmos must have known that the JOLSOC was celebrating its year of space um, this year because uh, just before 10 p.m. on Sunday, the 28th of February, it delivered us a brand new uh, UK uh, meteorite. And so I can show a little video of this thing coming through the atmosphere. Um, so in the UK, we actually have six dedicated camera networks that, that spend their time watching the skies, basically, uh, looking out for bits of extraterrestrial dust and rocks, um, creating meteors and fireballs in our atmosphere as, as they come in. Um, as they're traveling in at, at tens of kilometers per second. Uh, and those networks collaborate together. Um, so some of them are led by institutions, some of them are, are amateur networks, but they all collaborate uh, under this organization called the UK Fireball Alliance or UK Fall. Um, and so what happened when, when this event uh, took place at the end of February is that we actually captured it um, on, I think we were on 14, 15 of those dedicated camera cameras actually picked up this really spectacular fireball event. Um, and that's really important um, because we can do lots of fun science um, with that. Uh, the, the, the event was also uh, seen by uh, over a thousand um, eyewitness accounts from all across the UK. Uh, and also the skies were incredibly clear. So there were reports from, from Europe as well. Um, it was picked up on people's doorbell cameras. Um, it was picked up on dash cams in cars. So we got lots of amazing uh, footage, lots of reports of, of this fireball. Um, and so what we've been able to do, I'll just play it one last time. Um, what we've been able to do with all that data is, is actually, uh, we could work out that this object hit the top of the Earth's atmosphere. It was going at about 14 kilometers per second or so. Um, so that's relatively slow for these types of events. They can be anywhere up to about 70 kilometers per second. Uh, the fireball itself lasted for, for about seven seconds, um, right at the end, it's not so clear in this video, but right at the end of the fireball, um, just before it goes dark, uh, we can actually see uh, maybe three or four separate fragmentation events as well. Uh, and then it goes into what we call the dark flight, um, and that happens at an altitude of about 30 to 40 kilometers up. So one of the reasons we have um, the cameras is that it enables us to actually work out uh, whether we have uh, meteorites that may have landed on the Earth's surface. Uh, and if we do, roughly whereabouts um, they may have ended up. And so what we did on the Monday morning after the fireball event um, was UK Fall actually released uh, this really large search area. So, so taking all the, the video footage that was coming in, we could roughly work out, you know, if there were going to be any meteorites on the ground, this is, this is likely to be where they were. Um, so we actually put this out into the press on the Monday morning. 
Um, I have to admit at that point, you know, we thought there could be meteorites, but I didn't know if we'd really have much chance of, of recovering um, any of that material. Um, and so this is just a close up of the area. So it was a really large search area just to the northeast of, of Cheltenham. Um, so, you know, we were still working on the data trying to, to narrow this down, but you can see that this, this little town of Winchcombe um, sits right there in, in the middle of this search area that we initially released. Uh, most of this, this um, area is, is farmland or golf courses, um, which are not the easiest places to search for meteorites. So on Monday morning, we kind of did this, put it into the press and kind of hoped, we basically said, you know, if you think you've found anything that looks like a meteorite, um, and get in touch with us um, and we'll have a look and, and, you know, fingers crossed, we might get somewhere. And so what happened after, I mean, that Monday evening, so Monday was incredibly stressful, um, lots of doing TV interviews and radio interviews for, for many of us, trying to, to get the word out there. And then Monday evening, I received um, this picture. Uh, and it's an unusual pile of, of, of black rocks and, and, and powder that had been discovered by, a, by the Wilcock family on their driveway when they woke up on that Monday morning. Um, and so this picture came through to me and I kind of looked at it and went, well, it's really unusual. It could be a meteorite, but I'm not entirely sure. And, uh, and so again, I wasn't 100% convinced that this definitely was going to be part of the meteorite that had come down. Uh, and because at the time we were, we were in the full swing of, of lockdown, so it really wasn't as simple as just going uh, over there and, and checking it out. So I kind of, uh, that, there was this photo and another photo that came in that we kind of said, okay, once we've got permission to, to go and search the area, um, you know, we'll go and check it out uh, and, and see what they've got. Um, but I also forwarded this picture on to, to other people in the community. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Richard Greenwood from the Open University. So this is a slightly fuzzy picture of Richard here. Um, so he doesn't live too far away from, from Winchcombe. So on the Wednesday, he, he traveled over and, and uh, met the Wilcock family. Um, and then on that afternoon, I got a, an incredibly excited phone call uh, and some pictures from him saying that this is, we definitely have a meteorite on the ground here. Um, you need to get over here as quickly as you possibly can. And so it was exactly what I did. I, I uh, hopped on a train, abandoned everything else that was going on um, and got myself over to Cheltenham and out to Winchcombe. And so this is the two of us, um, uh, the Wilcock family's house. So this is outside, they'd set up, um, so it was dark by this time. Um, they'd set up a table, put some, some lights and spotlights out. And me and Richard spent a, a very, uh, happy and very stunned few hours kind of rummaging through all this material that they collected uh, and, and actually seeing that we, you know, we had a new UK uh, meteorite. It was really, I could probably do a whole separate talk on on that evening that I spent there and I had a very surreal night in a holiday inn, <laughs> but um, with a bag of rocks. Um, so what the Wilcock family had done was, was absolutely uh, just perfect, really. So they, they sent this picture in. Um, they realized they, they didn't know necessarily that it was a meteorite, but they realized that something unusual had happened. And so rather than just kind of sweeping it away and putting it in the bin, um, they collected all that material up and put it into, into plastic bags. They put it into some yogurt pots. Um, and so some of that material that landed on their driveway was collected probably within less than 12 hours of actually landing uh, on the Earth's surface, which is really amazing. And, and one of the quickest, if not the quickest recovered um, meteorite, um, short of catching it, you can't do it much quicker than that. Um, and as I said, we went over and they, they very kindly uh, basically gave me these bags of rocks that they'd collected um, uh, to take away uh, and transport back to the Natural History Museum. And so this is a picture here. So you can see most of this material, um, the very small fragments, it hit the driveway and exploded. Um, so there was stuff on the main kind of impact site, but also their front lawn was covered in these stones. So we spent several days picking things out of the lawn. Um, so uh, yeah, we've got lots of small stones that we've been curating and, and cataloging vials of powders these are the yogurt pots this is a toothbrush and brush that we were using to, to sweep up dust from the driveway uh, and so in total from the wilcox driveway we we recovered uh, about 350 grams or so um, of this material um, at the same time excuse me yeah at the same time um uh katie joy from the university of manchester and luke daly from the university of glasgow um, coordinated a, a search of the local area um, around Winchcombe and, and to the uh, to the west towards the villages of Woodmancote and, and Bishop's Cleeve. Uh, this was incredibly um, difficult and, and stressful, I think. Um, we managed to get small teams down there to do this, but, but because of the lockdown, uh, there was a lot of kind of behind the scenes paperwork just to get permission 
Um, you know, we didn't want to be seen to be breaking lockdown rules and things. So it was uh, slightly chaotic and we've learned a lot of lessons, I think, from doing it. Um, and I think I really, I, unfortunately, I didn't get to do any searching because I, I came back to the museum, but I think people appreciated the experience and, and uh, yeah, we learned a lot about how we would do this the, the next time. Um, but yeah, so they, they traipsed around in the cold um, in these lines like this, you can see. Um, and then on the Saturday, uh, the team from the University of Glasgow actually found this really beautiful fusion crusted stone um, in some farmland to the to the west of um, Winchcombe. Um, so this is really amazing, uh, just, just stunning. It's actually the biggest intact um, piece that we found and, and really incredible. Um, and we're really, really lucky that we, we had the opportunity to, to search and find this despite, despite the lockdown. Uh, so in total now, we, we know of about 650 grams of material that have been recovered from the local area. Um, most of that is now being curated um, at the Natural History Museum. We've been really lucky. So when a meteorite falls in the UK, it belongs to the, to the owner of the land. Um, so we've been really lucky that, 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 that many of the people who found or had material found on their property have actually donated that to the museum, um, to the National uh, Meteorite um, Collection. So, um, so just a special shout out, this is the Wilcock family who you may have seen in the press. Um, this is Victoria Bond, this is, she owns the land where this, um, where this stone was found. Um, this is David and Val Carrick, they found a small piece in their garden. Um, there are a few other um, families that have found material and, and they've all been absolutely uh, wonderful and incredibly generous um, in, in working with us and, and donating that material. So, so we've been really, really lucky um, to end up with, with 600 grams of, of meteorite, uh, new UK meteorite in the collection. So this is an up close picture of that uh, piece that, that the Glasgow team found. So actually, when they when they pulled it out of the um, out of the mud, it split into two. It's incredibly fragile. Um, so, but that's actually really nice because it allows us to see inside the meteorite and, and saved us having to break it open ourselves. Uh, this piece is now on display. If you're in London, um, you can come and see this at the Natural History Museum. Uh, it's it's just beautiful. Um, so you can see here. Uh, it has this kind of dark fusion crust with the, the, with the cracks. So this is what happens when it comes through the atmosphere, it basically gets cooked on the outside. Um, you can see this is really thin, this layer, it's only about a millimeter or so um, in size. You can see the mud still on, on one side from where, where it landed in the field. And then this, this picture maybe doesn't quite do it justice, but then we have this really dark interior. It, it really is uh, pitch black. I, I've never seen such a fresh and such a dark um, meteorite. It's really, really dark inside this. And then, it, then we have these little white flecks and there's some orangey flecks and things. So we knew, I mean, I knew as soon as Richard got over there and sent me some pictures and as soon as I saw it, we, we knew we had a, a carbonaceous chondrite um, type meteorite. So it's very likely it's gonna be, well, it will be called Winchcombe. We're still waiting for the official classification to be confirmed, but it will be named Winchcombe after where that main mass of material was found. Uh, it's the first meteorite fall to be recovered in the UK for 30 years. So that's really special. This is not something that, that happens every day. Um, the last one uh, was, was Glatton in 1991. Um, it's the first UK meteorite uh, with a known pre-atmospheric orbit. And I'll come back to why that's interesting. Uh, and it's also the first ever carbonaceous chondrite meteorite that's been recovered in the UK. So we, ha we have about 20 or so UK meteorites. We don't get many because we're a small island. Um, but uh, most of them are ordinary chondrites, there are a few ions. This is the first ever uh, carbonaceous chondrite that we've got. So just to also highlight how special an event this is, as I said, there are about sort of 65, 70,000 meteorites in our collections. Only about 5% of those are carbonaceous chondrites, so they're incredibly rare. Uh, that's partly because of where they're coming from in the solar system, um, but also they tend to be very fragile, so they don't survive coming through the atmosphere particularly well. Um, so for Winchcombe, we were lucky it was going slow. Um, and they also, they won't survive sitting on the Earth's surface for particularly long. They, they, they will weather away uh, much quicker than, than other types of meteorites. Um, so of that kind of, yeah, 5% so about just over 2,500. So of that 2,500 carbonaceous chondrites, there's only 51 that were witnessed falls. So where we actually saw them or somebody saw them coming down and, and then were able to go out uh, and try and collect that material as quickly as possible. Um, after the event. Most, most carbonaceous chondrites are what we call fines that just happen to be found in normally in desert type environments. Uh, and then of that 51, only four actually have uh, what we call pre-atmospheric orbits. Um, so this is incredibly rare. 
um, we don't get many meteorites where we have all this information. Um, and actually, out of that 60 odd thousand meteorites, there are only 40 that we have pre atmospheric orbits for. So, so this number is going up as, as people build camera networks, but it's still a, a rare thing. And so, as I said, um, we have a pre atmospheric orbit. We know roughly whereabouts in the solar system Winchcombe came from. So this is one of the other reasons that we have the camera networks is, is not only can we work out where material may have landed, but we can back out those orbits and understand um, the sources of, of extraterrestrial material to the Earth. Um, and so for Winchcombe, you can see this is the orbit that's been calculated. So we actually had this before we had the meteorite. Um, so this takes us back out to the outer part of what we call the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Um, so it has an orbit, it started its life off um, somewhere, somewhere near Jupiter. Um, and so that's really interesting. That provides us with context. So we can't say exactly which asteroid it came from, but we can say what, what part of the asteroid belt. And that gives us context for the rock and for this meteorite that we, we really don't have for, for most of the meteorites in our collections. Uh, and so some of the work that's going on now is trying to understand how big the object was that, that hit the top of the Earth's atmosphere and also how long it took for it to make that journey from, from the asteroid belt to the Earth. Uh, I know this is a, cos a, a geochemistry or cosmochemistry session. So um, this is a backscatter electron image. We've been doing um, kind of the first analysis is, is doing kind of mineralogy and petrology, um, some of the chemistry of, of this rock. Um, so this is yeah, backscatter electron image of one of the polished um, Winchcombe samples. Um, this is the element map. So, so iron in green, calcium in blue, uh, magnesium in red. Um, and so what I can say is, is the mineralogy uh, or the, the grain size, most of the grains are incredibly fine grained. It has a, it's a matrix rich rock. Um, most of the grains are kind of submicron. Um, the mineralogy is dominated by phyllosilicates and clay-like um, minerals, so, so silicates with OH and H2O bonds on the end. Um, we have a, this weird phase called tachilonite, which is like a, a sort of hydrated iron sulfide that is not particularly common on the Earth, but is seen in certain um, types of meteorite groups. And then we have things like magnetite and, and, and abundant carbonates. And the stones, some stones are very carbonate poor, some stones are very carbonate rich. Um, it's really interesting. Um, and so these are all products. This is a secondary mineral assemblage. They're all products of, of water rock interactions having taken place on the asteroid that Winchcombe is derived from. So this is telling us about, about where we had water um, in the early solar system. Um, for those of you more familiar with, with chondrite mineralogy and components, we, we do see things like chondrules and calcium aluminium inclusions. Um, this, so these are the, some of the first solid materials that we had within our solar system. Uh, however, where, where we do find them, they have been extensively replaced by, by, by phyllosilicates and carbonates. Um, so really highly altered. Um, we had very high water rock ratios on the, on the asteroid this came from. Um, Winchcombe is also a breccher. Um, so uh, we, it's very common. We've looked at lots of blocks now, um, and, and, and these are going out to all the, to the analysis teams as well. Um, it's, you know, all the blocks have multiple lithologies in them. So, so the mineralogy doesn't change so much, but the textures and the petrography. So you can see here, this is very different to the material in here. And um, so this is clearly a brecciated meteorite. That's not so unusual. And it, it tells us a lot about um, impacts and mixing materials on the, on the parent asteroid. Uh, one of the first things that we did, um, this was done within a few days of, of, of the meteorite being recovered, um, is to measure the oxygen isotopic compositions. And this was done uh, at the Open University. And so we use oxygen isotopes as a kind of fingerprint to classify uh, meteorites into different groups. And so without going into all the details, you can see that uh, different meteorite groups basically fall into, into different places on the, on the three oxygen isotope plot. And so Winchcombe, the data for Winchcombe sits right bang in the middle of, of what we call the CM carbonaceous chondrite field. So C for carbonaceous, M for McGay type, so that's the type specimen for the CMs. Um, and this is consistent with the, with the phyllosilicate rich uh, mineralogy. So, so Winchcombe is a, is a CM um, carbonaceous chondrite. And that's incredibly good for me because uh, I've spent most of my career studying um, CM chondrites. And so this is uh, really exciting uh, to have my have our own one in the UK that, that we can work with. Um, so why do I care about CM chondrites? Uh, so these are chemically um, really primitive. So they're, they're bulk chemistry. Um, and I should have the numbers for Winchcombe uh, any day now, I think it, it's been done. Uh, but their bulk chemistry is very close, normally very close to the solar photosphere. So chemically, they're very primitive, haven't really changed over the, over the history of the solar system. Um, so they're derived from these small asteroids that you know, formed 4.6 billion years ago, and then nothing's really happened um, ever since then. 
Um, so really, they, as I said, they take us back to, to time zero in our solar system. But they do contain, as I said, sort of up to 15 weight percent water locked up in this phyllosilicate rich uh, mineralogy. And so they can tell us about these water rock uh, reactions that were going on on these small bodies in the early solar system. So, you know, we can date things like the carbonate minerals using manganese, mang mang oh dear, mang manganese chromium dating. And, um, and so, uh, you know, it's likely that those water rock interactions were taking place within the first few million years of solar system history. Uh, they also contain a few weight percent carbon, so that's what gives it the really, really dark color. Uh, and that comes in all sorts of uh, different components. Um, so that includes the carbonate minerals, as I said, but also we have simple orga organic molecules in there and things like amino acids. And I, I'm pretty sure Queenie's going to tell you a little bit more about those. We also have pre-solar grains uh, that I know Catherine's going to talk about. Um, and so, uh, yeah, these are things that form before our solar system. And so really, I'm just going to finish. Um, I just want to make the point that um, Winchcombe really is a, a unique opportunity for, for the UK planetary science community. So, so one of the big questions we have in, in planetary science is, you know, why does the Earth have water? Why do we have life? And it's meteorites like Winchcombe and the, and the asteroids they come from that, uh, that potentially provided those ingredients. And so um, Winchcombe itself being such a fresh meteorite that hasn't been exposed to the terrestrial atmosphere um, can hopefully tell us a lot more than we can find out maybe from, from CM chondrites that have been sat on the earth for, for thousands of years. And uh, yeah, I will, I will stop there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ashley, that's great. Uh, super interesting. Uh, we've, we've got some pieces at St Andrews which we're excited to analyze as yeah. well. Um, uh, unfortunately, all of that interesting information means that we've gone a little bit long. Yes, yeah, I think the best uh, the best thing to do is uh, to perhaps ask uh, Ashley questions later on, uh, or in the chat, and let's move on.